my first sermon, <clears throat> fresh out of divinity school, was not my finest. I had just been hired as the youth minister at a boarding school in Indiana where I would work primarily with high school students who I had a lot of experience with, but over the summers, the camp, uh, the school hosted a, a camp for kids as young as age seven, who I had no experience with. And uh, the first time I was asked to preach at the all camp chapel service, I decided I would tackle the topic of the subtle dangers of sin, which is already a pretty bold choice um, to, to kick off carefree summer camp with. But I opened my sermon with this illustration that I had been taught in my own youth group years before. So I asked, do you know how the Eskimos hunt polar bears? And then I proceeded to explain the illustration. They dip the tip of a knife in seal's blood, and then they sit it outside to freeze, and they do that many times, repeat until they've made a nice, thick blood popsicle. And then they travel outside the camp, and they stick the the handle of the knife down in the snow, bury it, return to camp, and wait. And the polar bear is attracted by the smell of the seal's blood, and they come and begin licking until his tongue gets cold and numb. By the time he reaches the inner blade of the knife, his tongue is so numb he doesn't realize that he's no longer licking seal's blood but his own. And Eskimos come back a few days later, and there's the polar bear. It's a powerful illustration of the numbing, desensitizing effects of seemingly innocent sin. It's also a great way to traumatize seven-year-olds, <laughs> I found out. I was called into the head chaplain's office the next day, angry parents calling to complain. They're poor kids, first time away from home. Now they can't sleep. Minds filled with images of bloody, lifeless polar bears. Well, in stark contrast to my experience, my first sermon stands the Apostle Peter's first sermon recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. Peter's inaugural sermon was actually his best sermon ever. It's the first sermon in the history of the church. If you were with us last week, you remember we witnessed the birth of the church at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The first 13 verses, but I would go so far as to argue that Peter's sermon here, verses 14 through 41, is in fact the first and best sermon of all time. Now, some of you may be thinking, hold on a minute. What about Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount? Surely Jesus holds the title of first and best sermon ever preached. Well, that depends on how you define a sermon. The Bible itself never calls Jesus' lesson on the Mount a sermon, and I will explain later why I don't think it was, but instead I'm going to propose that Peter's sermon here in Acts 2 offers us an excellent template for understanding what a sermon is. This is a model sermon, a five-fold model. There are five marks of an effective biblical sermon that we need to observe in Peter's example here this morning. But before we do, why does any of this matter for you? Because obviously, you know, what goes into a good sermon is important for me, it's important for Pastor Thad, but the vast majority of you will never preach a sermon in your life. So why do you need to know the ingredients of a good sermon? Let me offer you three reasons why you should still pay attention this morning. Number one, to become a better sermon listener. The Apostle Paul exhorted his mentee, Timothy, to preach the word for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and they will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. You need to know that as a sinner, your natural inclination is to gravitate toward preachers that just tell you what you want to hear that you're a good person, that God loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change a thing about yourself, that God wants to bless you with health and wealth and happiness. 
bring nothing but good into your life. And if you don't know what a biblical sermon sounds like, you will be more susceptible to wander off into such myths. Number two, you also want to become a better sermon encourager. That when you receive good biblical preaching, first and foremost, you praise God, from whom all blessings flow. But you also ought to encourage the preacher. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Paul exhorts us to encourage one another, build one another up. And in the very next verse, Paul gives us this example of encouragement. He says, respect those who labor among you and over you in the Lord to admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And I can just tell you how much it means to me to receive a word of encouragement from you after a sermon. Like every preacher, I have weeks up here where I question whether what I'm doing even makes a difference. Like, is anyone out there even listening? Just playing on their phones. I have to call you out if you you forget to silence your phone message. But it's such a blessing in those times to receive encouragement. And to be reminded that God's word does not return void even when it's being preached by an imperfect sinner like me. Number three, you should listen this morning because you want to become a better sermon appreciator. My hope and prayer is that this sermon about sermons might help you better appreciate why it is that you sit underneath the preaching of God's word every Sunday in the first place. Why this corporate spiritual discipline of hearing God's word preached is so vital to your personal spiritual health. David Mathis writes that few practices will energize and affect your Christian life as much as sitting attentively under faithful preaching. It is that one half hour each week when the assembly of the redeemed closes her collective mouth opens her ears and hearts, and hears the uninterrupted voice of her husband through his appointed mouthpiece, fallible though the messenger may be. Christian, do you know that this is the most important 40 minutes of your week? Not because my words are so important, but because God's words are. When God speaks, his people listen. God wants to speak to you this morning through his word. And so without further ado, let's hear his voice together this morning from Acts 2, 12 through 41. Let me remind you, as you find it in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, we'd love to bless you with one of those. We've got free Bibles we'd love to give you at the info bar. But let me remind you of the context as you find it, as Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit has just descended in power on this group of 120 apostles and early Christ followers, the early church, and they began speaking in all kinds of different foreign human languages represented by this diverse crowd of Jewish pilgrims all gathered in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. They each hear the gospel in their own language, and they are amazed. And so that's where we pick up the story here in verse 12. If you would stand with me as you're able Out of respect for the reading of God's word, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And, in, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has now poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and he continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Praise God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity this morning and every Sunday to sit underneath the preaching of your word. God, I pray that my words would be few, your words would be many, your people need to hear from you this morning. Would you empty me, use me as a, as a vessel, an instrument, a mouthpiece to speak to your people for their sanctification and for your glory, I pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A good sermon does five things. Number one, it clarifies reality. A good sermon clarifies reality. That's what Peter does for the crowd here in verses 12 through 21. He's clarifying, he's helping them make sense of reality, specifically this reality right in front of their eyes and ears that they're seeing and hearing this group of 120 uneducated Galileans preaching in perfect, fluent Latin and Egyptian and Cappadocian, Phrygian. This crowd doesn't know how to even begin to make sense of that reality. They are all amazed and perplexed, the text says. The only possible explanation they can come up with on their own, verse 13, is that the apostles are all drunk. Now, I don't know about you, but the drunk people I've hung out with seem to have trouble speaking coherently in English, much less foreign languages, that they don't know, but that's the best natural explanation that the crowd can come up with. They're drunk because they don't yet realize that this is a supernatural event. There is no natural cause. So Peter has to clarify for them. He explains it for them. Now, I can't help but point out, before we move on, 
Verse 15, for you Baptists, Peter's opening argument as to why the apostles, apostles can't possibly be drunk isn't that they're good Christians who would never touch alcohol. Rather, it's nine in the morning. That's what he says. It's like, like I enjoy a nice Merlot as much as the next apostle, but it's 9 a.m. Now, I'm not suggesting the early church was throwing raging parties every weekend. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That's actually a great reference, though, for this next point, because that's exactly what's happening here at Pentecost. They are being filled with the Spirit. Verse 16, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. 800 years prior to the birth of Christ, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32 of his Old Testament book, which Peter quotes directly here, Joel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had foretold three key features of the Spirit's arrival in the life of the church. Number one, the Spirit's arrival would mean diversity for the church. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters, young and old, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. Every type of person is now included. This is a radical departure from the ethnocentric exclusivism of first century Judaism. Number two, the spirit-filled church would be characterized by diversity and by activity. Activity, they shall prophesy, shall see visions, shall dream dreams, all of them. There's this idea in Pentecostalism, for those of you who are familiar with that denomination, Pentecostalism, that certain folks are specially anointed by the Lord for ministry. According to the Bible, those people are called Christians. Every true believer in Christ has been anointed, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We are all baptized into one spirit, anointed, filled with the Holy Spirit for the purpose of ministry. First of all, to the church, 1 Peter 4, 10 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another in the church as well as for ministry to the world. Acts 1, 8, remember, a few weeks ago, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? So you will be my witnesses to the lost. So we're anointed for activity, witnessing, encouraging one another. Thirdly, the Spirit's arrival will be accompanied by diversity, activity, and urgency. Urgency. Peter, quoting Joel here, warns us that we're living in the last days, that Jesus' death and resurrection was the climax of redemptive history, and now we're awaiting the culmination of redemptive history at his second coming, anticipated here in verses 19 through 21, called the great and magnificent day of the Lord, accompanied by wonders and signs, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. We got a glimpse of it. Peter must have been reminded as he's remind, uh, reminding them of this prophecy, a glimpse of it when the sun was turned to darkness in the middle of the day at Jesus' crucifixion, right? Just 50 days ago. That was a glimpse of what's to come when Christ returns and the old heavens and the old earth are set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies melt as they burn, 2 Peter 3, verse 12. But why, why does Peter quote the second half of this prophecy of Joel? Why does Peter go all apocalyptic on them? I think it's to convey this sense of urgency that we don't, listen, brothers, he's telling the brothers, you don't have forever to sit around and search the scriptures and question and research and skepticize and deconstruct and decide whether or not Jesus was the real deal and you're going to follow him or not. He's going to come back. And when he does, it's to rescue his church, but it's to execute judgment on his opponents. Don't tarry, don't delay. And so what is Peter's advice? He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Today. Today can be the, the day of your salvation for you this morning, West Hills. So Peter helps his listeners make sense of reality, both their immediate context, a bunch of spirit-filled Galileans speaking in languages they don't even know, as well as their eternal reality. Call on the name of the Lord or else. 
This is what a sermon does. It helps you clarify all of reality, specifically through the lens of God's word. That's where Peter takes them. Back to the Old Testament, back to the scriptures in order to explain things. A sermon must be biblical. It helps us see reality through a biblical worldview. That's what a sermon does. Number two, a biblical sermon must also convict its listeners of their sin. A good sermon ought to convict you of your sinfulness. Verses 22 and 23, Peter declares, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves well know. You might remember in John chapter 3, there's a story of a religious leader named Nicodemus sneaks out under cover of night for fear of being seen and excommunicated by his fellow Pharisees. He sneaks out to meet with Jesus And he tells Jesus, he confesses, that we know that you come from God. Our secret Pharisee meetings, we we all know that you come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The Pharisees knew exactly who Jesus was, and they knew exactly what they were doing when they killed him. And yet, the very same ones who did are right here in this crowd at Pentecost, who Peter's preaching to. They're there, gathered in Jerusalem, the temple square. But does Peter pull punches? Does a good sermon pull punches? Listen, you you all write my paycheck. I have a vested personal interest in making sure you all leave here every Sunday feeling really happy and good about yourselves. (laughs) It's no wonder that the wealthiest pastors in the world preach so little about sin. Sin doesn't sell. Most people would much rather hear about how much good they deserve from God instead of how much the truth about how much wrath and judgment and hell they deserve. But Peter gives it to them straight. He gives it to them straight. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed And I wish we had more time. We could spend a whole sermon on this theological aside here and unpack Peter's juxtaposition, the concurrence here of God's sovereignty with man's agency, that Jesus' crucifixion was simultaneously the most wicked, ungodly act, crime, ever perpetrated in human history, and yet it was also the very centerpiece of God's own redemptive plan devised before the foundation of the world. Both those things are true. We could spend a whole sermon on it, but Peter's main point to them here in verse 23 is that you killed Jesus. That's his point. You killed Jesus, our Messiah, the Son of God. You killed him. It's a hard thing to preach to people. But friends, if I could just take a page out of Peter's book this morning, this model sermon, I need to tell you the difficult truth that you killed Jesus. Do you know that? That you killed Jesus. The Pharisees may have convicted him. The Roman soldiers may have driven the nails into his hands and feet. But it was your sin, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Do you believe that? It's a difficult reality to be convicted of, isn't it? That you killed Jesus? I wonder if we considered that before you badmouthed your boss around the water cooler, before you clicked on that advertisement that you shouldn't be navigating to, before you snap at your kids, before you demanded your way with your spouse, before you skipped church on Sunday, I wonder if we could somehow train ourselves to envision every one of our sins as a nail 
being pounded into Jesus' hands, his feet, if we would be so flippant and casual about our disobedience. In John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus said that when he sends the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will convict the world concerning sin. It's good. It's hard to be convicted of your sin, isn't it? To feel the sting of your sin. But Jesus says it's a good thing. It's of God. The conviction of sin is of God. And if we skip ahead in Acts 2 to the end of Peter's sermon, the crowd's response to his sermon, we read in verse 37 that when they heard his message, they were cut to the heart. That the Spirit not only empowers Peter to preach the truth to them with unashamed boldness, but the same Spirit must also enable his sinful listeners to receive that truth with naked conviction, with the vulnerable admission that, you know what, I think he's right. I am a sinner. We did kill Jesus. If you want to know why the vast majority of your loved ones and the vast majority of people in general who hear the gospel will refuse to receive Christ. This is why. It's not that they are such modern, enlightened people who have no need for God, what with their science and their secular ethics. It's not that they have a difficult time reconciling a good God with the evil around them in the world. It's not even that they have learned to distract themselves with work and friends and phone and TV so that they can avoid the topic altogether. The busiest, most distracted people among us still can't help but be plagued and nagged by this question of the afterlife and their eternal destination. The Bible says so. God has put eternity in the heart of man. You can't escape it. No. The reason that people reject Jesus is that he convicts them of their sin, and they don't like it. Jesus said, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Buddha says, be good. Muhammad says, be good. Secular humanism says, be good. But Jesus has the audacity to say, you're not good. And unfortunately, most people stop listening right there. They check out, they tune out, and they fail to hear the second half of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, that even though, no, you're not good, I, Jesus, am very good, and I traded my righteousness for all of your unrighteousness on the cross and laid down my life as a perfect sacrifice for sin for you, to reconcile you to a perfect God. That's the gospel. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But it requires the admission that you're a sinner. Jesus said, only the sick will call the doctor. I saw a sweatshirt the other day that read, you are enough. And I just tell you, clarify reality for you from a biblical worldview, nothing is farther from the truth. Nothing is more anti-gospel than that. I wanted to put on a sweatshirt Find a sweatshirt, Pastor's Appreciation Month, you can make one for me, that said, you are not enough, but praise God, Jesus is. That's the gospel. Trust in him. A sermon must convict you of your sin, but it must also, number three, clearly convey the gospel, the good news, the second half that I just mentioned, the good news about Jesus. The bad news is you're a sinner. The good news is God's provided a savior for your sin. Peter's sermon doesn't end in verse 23. You killed Jesus, amen. Now go home and think about what you did. No, Peter continues in verse 24. He says, but God raised him up 
loosing the pangs of death because it was not even possible for him to be held by it. The good news is Jesus is so powerful, there's something he can't do. You probably thought Jesus' you know, omnipotence meant he can do everything. There's at least one thing he can't do. He can't sin either, but he can't stay dead. Jesus is so full of life, he can't even stay dead. He triumphed even over death. Now, if I had given you all a one question, true or false quiz this morning, and opened the sermon by asking you, true or false, the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I suspect that most of you would have raised your hands and said that was true. And it is true, it's gloriously true, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. But friends, that is not the gospel. It's at least, it's not the whole gospel. The whole gospel is that Jesus not only died to pay the penalty of your sins, but he was raised from the dead to defeat the very power of sin and hell and death and give you eternal life. That's the gospel. According to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus had stayed dead, if the resurrection is just a hoax, then you and I are still dead in our sins and your faith is futile. Christianity is pointless. Peter's sermon here is the first of nine different gospel presentations throughout the book of Acts that we'll see this year. Each one a little different, but spoiler alert, there's one thing they all share in common. You know the one thing that every gospel presentation in the book of Acts and every gospel presentation that's been preached for the last 2,000 years has in common? It's Jesus' resurrection, his death and resurrection. He didn't stay dead, and that's really good news for you and me. Listen, you can deliver the most moving, inspiring, even biblical message. I have heard, and I'm sure you have, some really powerful pep talks on Sunday mornings that, that may sprinkle in some scripture along the way. But listen, if you're not preaching the gospel, it's not a sermon. It might be a great motivation, motivational speech. It might be an important call to social action. It might even be a helpful Bible lesson, help you understand the Bible better. But without the gospel, if you haven't preached Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, it's not a sermon. And so that's why I say that Matthew 5, Jesus' sermon on the mount wasn't a sermon. Peter preaches a sermon here. This is a sermon. He preaches the life, verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who you all witnessed. You saw him walk around and walk, work miracles. Jesus was incarnated as God in the flesh. The life, the death, verse 23, you crucified and killed him. And the resurrection, verse 24, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death of Jesus. Life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the gospel. Jesus lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserved in our place. And he was raised to give us the power over death and new life in him. That's the gospel. Trust in him and you will be saved this morning. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. It's Lord and Christ, Savior. Number four, a good sermon will center on Christ in the scriptures. Sermons ought to center on Christ in all the scriptures. Jesus claimed in John 5, 39, that the scriptures, the Old Testament in his day, all bore witness to him. On the road to Emmaus, the risen Jesus opened his disciples' minds and hearts to understand in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So according to Jesus, all of scripture points to Jesus. And I've already emphasized that a sermon has got to be biblical over one-third of Peter's sermon here is direct quotation from the Old Testament. 
Joel 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110. But it's not enough for a sermon to merely be biblical. It's got to point us to Jesus in all of Scripture. If Jesus says, I am the aim, the fulfillment, all of it bears witness to me, and we're just teaching good moral lessons, and we're not pointing them to Jesus, then we miss the point. A good sermon must be Christocentric. Peter references King David here. He gives us an example. King David in verses 25 through 35. Again, great sermon. Could totally split it into two weeks, but I want to I wanna keep moving. The summary of Peter's argument here is that David rejoiced in Psalm 16 that God wouldn't let his Holy One rot in the grave. And yet, Peter says, hey, we all know where, where David's tomb is located in Bethlehem down the road. So clearly David wasn't prophesying about himself. He wasn't talking about himself. He's prophesying about some other future coming messianic immortal king. Verse 31, Peter explains, being a prophet, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, of the Messiah. And then he identifies the Christ for them by name, this Jesus God has raised up. And of that, Peter says, we are all witnesses. Peter is going to write later in his second epistle, 2 Peter 1, he says, we were eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty, his miracles, most especially the miracle of his resurrection. I saw him with my own two eyes. This is what makes Christianity so unique and compelling in comparison to almost every other world religion. No one witnessed Muhammad go up on the mountain and receive the Quran from Allah. No one witnessed Joseph Smith walk off into the woods and receive the golden tablets from the angel Moroni. No one witnessed the spontaneous, undirected Big Bang by which atheist scientists would have us believe the universe just popped into existence out of nothing. Those religions, Islam, Mormonism, atheism, they require real faith, belief without sight, belief without evidence. But the disciples actually witnessed with their own two eyes the resurrected Jesus. Walk around, talk with them for 40 days. They walked to Emmaus with him. They fished with him. They watched him walk through walls. They did you know, tricks and poked their fingers through the nail holes in his hands. And then, verse 33, Peter says, we witnessed him in Acts chapter 1, we witnessed him be exalted to the right hand of God the Father. So Peter argues, David didn't ascend into the heavens. That was Jesus. Jesus was the Lord who David was prophesying about in Psalm 110, who would one day sit at God's right hand. And because all of Scripture bears witness to Jesus, Peter could have gone on all day long expositing passage after passage of the Old Testament for them, but Peter also knew a sixth bonus trait of a good sermon. It should be concise. Peter's sermon is about 500 words in the Greek. My sermon is about 10 times that, just for reference. We can't all be as short and sweet as Peter. I would point out, though, that verse 40 says, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. So apparently Luke is just uh, recording the Cliff's Notes version of Peter's entire unabridged sermon. Who knows how long it was? I'm sure it got him in trouble with his children's minister as well. <laughs> but why could Peter go on all day long? pointing them to Jesus and all the scriptures. It was because not only did Peter know that all the scriptures testify about Jesus, but Peter knew all the scriptures. Peter knew scripture. This was his spiritual food. Peter hadn't prepared for this sermon at Pentecost. He's not like me, holding up in a study all day on Saturday, preparing, got to write it all down so I don't forget, got to make sure I know wait, what passage and verse, chapter and verse was that? Yeah, no. 
Peter just Peter had so immersed himself and internalized these scriptures that they just naturally bubbled up out of him at Pentecost. When the famous pastor Charles Spurgeon was asked, "How do you know if someone's a Christian?" Spurgeon replied, "If you cut him, he will bleed Bible." Is that you? Do you bleed Bible? Is God's word what just naturally bubbles up out of you? Can you see Christ in all the scriptures? We need to pray for a heart of faith to treasure God's word above all else. And we pray for the eyes of faith to see Jesus here on every page of God's word. Finally, number five. A good sermon will call its listeners to respond in faith. A good sermon calls you to respond in faith. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, I don't want to take too much away from the power of this call to response, but I do want to say a quick word about baptismal regeneration, about this idea that baptism is what saves you, that some Christians have believed. After all, Peter says here, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. But the Greek word for for ice similar to our English word for, in that it can mean in order to accomplish, as in get baptized, in order to accomplish the forgiveness of your sins, so that God will forgive your sins, but it can also mean because of, as in get baptized because God has forgiven your sins. If I told you the truth, that I had to spank my son this morning for disobedience. You wouldn't think that I spanked him in order to accomplish his disobedience, would you? No, I spanked him because of his disobedience, for disobedience. Baptism is an outward sign of your internal cleansing that occurred when you repented, you turned from your sin, and you were washed of all your sins. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares the beautiful truth of the gospel, that it is by grace we have been saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. That includes baptism. If your baptism was the work by which you were saved, or better yet, I was the one who baptized some of y'all. If, if I can claim that work of ba- my baptism of you saved you, and I get to boast. I've saved a lot of people around here. But friends, I can't save anyone. Only Jesus can. And so I will end this sermon the same way Peter did his, by calling you to faith in him. Trust in Jesus. He alone can save you. Maybe you're here this morning and you have confessed your sin to the Lord, but you have not yet repented. You have not yet turned from your sin and followed Christ instead. Maybe that is God's calling you to faith this morning. Maybe you have surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you've even walked with Jesus for many years now, but you have not yet been baptized in obedience to Christ as a powerful public symbol of all that he has done for you. Repent and be baptized. It's clear, biblically, this is God's will for you in Christ. Maybe some of you need to join the church. You need to go from consumer to contributor. Stick around for the membership class. Got extra food here in 15 minutes. What does the next step in your walk with the Lord look like this morning? 
Only you can answer that as the Holy Spirit convicts you, challenges, and calls you. Remember, Peter says, all who God calls to himself, as, as the Lord calls you to himself this morning, how is he calling you to respond in faith? Clarify reality, conviction of sin, conveying the gospel, centering on Jesus, and then calling you to faith. This is what God's word does for you in Christ. Let's pray.